Hello everyone, I'm Lazy Grouse, and today we're gonna go through all the units and mechanics of the High Elves in SVO Grim Hammer 2. First off, we have the High Elven Archers with Heavy Arrowheads, which is an archer unit that either replaces the archers with light armor, or they are archers with light armor that got heavy arrowheads and changed their names. Either way, like the light armor variant, they have more armor than the basic archer, but they have shorter range and longer reload time, which lowers their damage over time. They do have much higher AP damage with 12 compared to the base variant's 5, and that might not sound like a lot, but against high armored units it makes a huge difference. Overall I think they're a good addition since it gives you a meaningful choice whether to bring a basic archer unit or heavy arrowhead archer depending on what you think you will be fighting. Gate guards are a unit that was technically already in the base game, but they were only available as a garrison unit, but in Grimhammer they can be recruited normally. They're a hybrid archer unit with spears similar to Lothern Sea Guards but with generally better stats in both melee combat and at range. Although they don't have shields available like Lothern Sea Guards have, so they aren't as sturdy against other archer units. They also have bolstered marksmanship which buffs allies in range with missile damage and accuracy, so they also make the rest of your archers better. Lothern Skycutters is a flying chariot unit pulled by great eagles with bolt throwers and archers mounted on it. It's pretty deadly both at range and charging into infantry, and since it's flying and really fast, it's great at finding good engagements. The unit card suggests that it doesn't deal a lot of damage with its ranged attack, but it's a bit misleading because I think it only shows the ranged damage from the bolt throwers. But each elf on the model also shoots arrows, which deals pretty decent damage. It can also fire while they're moving, and although the bolt thrower only shoot in a cone forward, the archers shoot in 360 degrees. And they also cause bleeding on attack, which deals some extra damage over time while they're in melee combat. Overall, it's just an excellent unit that's really fun to use. Shadow Striders are a spare infantry unit that is exclusive to Alethanar, and as expected from a Nagarith exclusive unit, it is very stealthy. They have Vanguard deployment, Strider, Stock and Unspottable, so they have the whole lineup of stealthy abilities so they can sneak up on any unit without being spotted. They can also create Shadow Clones to confuse the enemy and stealth away if their health ever drops below 50%. They have pretty good offensive stats with a good melee attack that causes bleeding on hit and decent damage with a big anti lodge bonus and Frenzy to top off their stats. They're pretty fragile however with a low health pool for an SFO unit and a low armor. They do have good melee defense to mitigate this in melee combat though. The Maiden Guard is a legendary melee variant of Sisters of Avalorn, and you would think that they would be exclusive to Avalorn, but they're available to all High Elven factions through Gay and Vale. They're a spear infantry and they're a bit strange, because as Sisters of Avalorn with spears, you would think they would have anti-large and magic attacks, but they have neither of these. They are instead a generally strong infantry unit with generally good stats. They also have the Banner of the Ever Queen, which buffs all units in range with melee attack and vigor. Each of the High Elf sub-factions have gotten some new goodies to play with, but the High Elves as a whole has also gotten some new tweaks to their existing mechanics. First of all, their Intrigue at Court mechanic have been expanded to give more powerful options for a much higher influence cost. Instead of just increasing and decreasing opinions, you can now force alliances, establish trade, force factions into war, force factions to accept peace, and even confederate. Each of the High Elf factions have also gotten some technologies unique to them that reflects their playstyle or lore, but they also have a new technology category shared between all the High Elf factions that you can spend excess influence to get some strong technologies. These technologies give recruit rank to specific types of lords and capacity to the different heroes, and they each lead to technologies that buffs them in combat. They have also gotten the stance Noble Prestige, which generates influence, increases replenishment and protects against enemy heroes and ambushes, but it also reduces growth and increases upkeep faction-wide. Tyrion has gotten some much needed new mechanics in Grimhammer that focuses on uniting the High Elves and Tyrion's ability to recruit only the very strongest and most skilled High Elven warriors to his armies. Playing as Tyrion, you will want to unite the High Elves through Confederation, because they have gotten a new mechanic unique to Eatine that gives them a faction-wide buff every time they confederate the High Elf faction. The buff you receive depends on the faction you confederate, as each faction gives a unique buff. So to all the completionists out there, gotta catch them all! Tyrion's other mechanic focuses on getting the best Elven warriors Althuan can offer with his ability to exalt units. This mechanic gives you the ability to upgrade most low to mid tier units to exalted variants of those units, which gives them some specific buffs to make them much better at their role. Each unit's buff is unique to them, and exalting a unit allows you to keep them around longer in the campaign without them being completely outclassed by higher tier units. To get exalted units, you need to be in a settlement, the unit you want to exalt needs to be at rank 7 or higher, and you need to pay a fee to exalt the unit. The unit then gets their buffs, but they also get a cosmetic change to differentiate them from the base variant. Tyrion have also gotten some new technologies. There are two new categories available that differ significantly, Retribution and Unity. And you will have to choose one of these to focus on, as once you pick one, 
the other one will be unavailable. These technologies cost a currency that is unique to the category that you chose and have the same name. Retribution is gained from battles and you can gain between 1 to 5 retribution each battle. And unity is generated from having entertainment buildings. You get one unity each turn from every entertainment building you own, regardless of the level of the building. Retribution focuses on war and rewards an aggressive playstyle as it mostly gives combat buffs, increased income from raising and looting, as well as some bonuses to movement and replenishment. Each of these technologies also reduces the diplomatic relations with every other faction that isn't high elves. Unity, however, focuses more on campaign effects like public order, growth, income, construction costs and your lords and heroes. And each of these technologies instead increases the diplomatic relations with each other faction that isn't high elves. Techless is known to be one of the most powerful sorcerers in the world, but didn't really have any mechanics to reflect that. In Grimhammer, he's gotten some much needed love and his campaign is now heavily focused on his mastery of magic and other casters in his faction. Techless has gotten scholarly tomes as a new currency that reflects his mastery of magic. These tomes are generated by Techless, Lord Masters of Hoeth, and some events where you can spend tomes for a buff or gain tomes for a cost. The tomes are generated fairly slowly, but they can be spent on some really powerful abilities in the technology tree. There's a new category in the technology tree for each lore of magic available to the High Elves. And the first technology in each of these categories gives Techless and Archmages of the lore a very powerful army ability that is a more powerful version of a spell in that lore. They also lead to two follow-up technologies, one that lowers miscast chance, cooldown for spells in the lore, as well as a campaign bonus, and the other one gives various thematic combat buffs to your armies and upkeep reduction to all casters. And all of these technologies will make Teclis an absolute monster in the late game as he unlocks more and more of the army abilities. And once he mastered all of them, he gets access to Grand Mastery, which gives you more buffs to your casting, research, faster construction for mages building, and magic resistance for swordmasters and lore masters of Hoeth. Lariel is all about safeguarding Ulthuan from invaders and corruption, and it's represented well through her existing mechanics, but it's been expanded with her new currency, Gifts of Isha. Gifts of Isha can be spent on units to give them strong buffs and in her tech tree, but to unlock her unique technologies, you must first build a landmark in Gaean Vale, World Root Entrance, Withered, which will unlock Embodiment of Isha, which gives you 100 capacity of the resource. And at the start of the game, your capacity for the currency is capped at zero, so you can't get any gifts until you research this technology, but once it's researched, you can start accumulating the gifts like normal. Gifts of Isha is gained in a couple of different ways. You gain it from unique technologies. Each of these technologies generates Gifts of Isha and some combat or campaign buff. The buff of each technology in the categories all share a common theme. Vengeance gives protection when fighting Dark Elves or Chaos. Purity focuses on characters and casters. Love focuses on campaign bonuses like replenishment, growth and research. Mother gives bonuses to handmaidens and sisters of Avalorn. And Life focuses on the tree units. You also get Gifts of Isha from Defender of Ulthuan, and the higher the trust from the people are, the more gifts you get. Her ability, Power of Nature, also grants Gifts of Isha, so gifts will be generated by just visiting your settlements. Gifts of Isha can also be spent on buffs for your units. Lethane gives Power Reserve and Recharge, and some melee attack and reload skill. Kuilisha gives Regeneration and Magic Resistance. Sethai for Speed and Vigor. Elthrai for Damage Resistance and Cause Fair. And Zenlui for Range, Physical Resistance and Expert Charge Defense. And these buffs can be given to any infantry unit. Alithanar is known for subterfuge and assassinations, and is one of the few that have the favor of the crow goddess Morai Heg. So his new currency, the Soul Tokens, is generated by performing the invocations of Morai Heg, which grants you one each time. The right also gives you campaign movement range, missile and weapon damage at the cost of melee defense. It's got a 15 turn cooldown, so you can at most get one token every 15 turn. The soul tokens can be spent in the technology tree in four different categories and you need two tokens to get the first in each category. There are four categories, infantry, cavalry and monsters, druki and lords and heroes, and as you would expect, they focus on bonuses to what they are named after, with the final technology in each category giving bonuses to shadow walkers and shadow striders. And once all of the starter technologies in each category have been researched, you can get the shadow stalkers technology which gives you a big buff to your faction and really emphasizes the stealthy nature of Nagarith. Eltharion and his Mistwalkers haven't gotten many new goodies, but he really didn't need it since his mechanics from the DLC were already good. He have gotten some additional uses for Ward and Supply with some new technologies if you don't want to spend it on his prison or if you're done upgrading it already. The technologies are unlocked once Tori Bress is at tier 3, and each technology costs 10 supply each. They all have effects that target certain factions, so you'll want to pick technologies depending on what you're fighting. There is also a technology, a Warden's Duty, separated from the others that doesn't unlock until you capture Massive or Call. This technology gives you some big campaign buffs as well as causing terror when fighting greenskins. 
Imric is the Lord of Dragons and he loves his dragons and his campaign is focused on getting some awesome unique dragons and burninating countryside. So in Grimhammer he's gotten some new goodies focusing entirely on his dragon mechanics. His dragon encounters have been tweaked slightly, originally leaving the dragon bee would have no benefit, but now you get a new currency, the blood of Kalador. But you don't have to leave it be to get the blood of Kalador, since the second way of getting the blood of Kalador is fighting the dragon and win. Beating the dragon gives you the unique item, the temporary faction wide buff and lets you recruit the dragon as usual. But the traits gained from the battle have been improved and also gives you blood of Kalador every turn. So the best way to collect the blood long term is to beat the dragon. The Blood of Kalidor can be spent on Imric's unique technologies where you will get some pretty standard technology bonuses, but you also get followers and equipment to get some interesting buffs and customization options for your lords and heroes. Like most of the other legendary lords, he's got a separate stronger technology, but unlike them, it's tied to the original technology tree. Once you've unlocked all the other technology categories, you can get a huge relations hit with all the non-high elf factions, but get a really strong campaign and combat buff, but due to the diplomatic relations from this technology, you have to be ready to fight most other factions when researching this technology. And that's all the units and mechanics of the high elves in SFO Grim Number 2. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, consider leaving a like, comment and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye!